Before we start looking at the various tools that are offered on sysinternals, I, I thought we'd start by first talking about where sysinternals came from, its purpose for existence. Back in 1996, Bryce Cogswell and I had freshly graduated from uh, our PhD programs together, and we started to write tools for Windows NT. In fact, our first tool was one that we'll see a little bit later. It's one of the most popular tools still on the site. It was Regmon. Back, that was back in 1996, and it started out as ntinternals.com. Within a couple months of launching the website, we'd had about 10 tools developed, and we posted it on the site. Word started to spread about it, and we had about 1,500 visitors a day. It was really a place where we could just do development of tools that would help us understand Windows to help debug, and that we thought we'd share with other people. We started Winternals, by the way, about the same time as a place where we would actually sell some of the software we felt might be just a little bit too, more, too valuable to give away for free. Now in the year 2006, Sysinternals has roughly 75,000 to 80,000 visitors a day, even more if there's a special new release of some software or a special blog post, and there are about 100 different tools on the site. We're continuously re revising tools, adding new tools. The site's a pretty dynamic place, as you'll see. Now, Mark, what's the reason behind the uh, site name change? Well, actually, lawyers from a certain company in a certain northwestern state contacted us and told us that they weren't happy with their use of uh, trademarked two letters in the name of the URL. So we decided to uh, voluntarily pull down the site, relaunch it as sysinternals.com, which actually turned out to be good. This was back in 1997, before Windows 2000 had come up, before the NT name was dropped from the Windows uh, operating system title. And so we were actually ahead of the wave in changing the name and distancing ourselves from NT. Now, the name of the site, NT Internals, wasn't the only thing Microsoft didn't like about that site. In fact, our first uh, connection was my awareness of the things that you were posting on that site that were offensive to Microsoft. Right, and uh, I'm not, I don't feel proud about bringing this part up. Well, actually, it did serve a purpose at the time. I'd find bugs in Windows and write tools like uh, NT Crash is one of the tools that I wrote that would bombard the system call interface with random garbage and end up finding a number of places in the kernel that didn't properly check for parameter le legality and would end up crashing the system. So I thought, hey, I'm going to post about this and uh, rather than go through the proper official channels of submitting it to Microsoft and letting them address the problem. You have to remember, though, it was a different time. Security wasn't such a big is issue. It was more of a reliability issue back then. So it wasn't like today where if somebody posted that, hackers would go take advantage of it and spread worms. When you approached me to work on the third edition of Inside Windows 2000, and I went to the Windows kernel team and said, there's this guy, Mark Racinovich, they shuddered. Uh, however, I assured them that he had been reformed. In fact, I like to kid Mark that he's been assimilated uh, by Microsoft. And, and in, to an extent, that's true. I think you're, not, you're, yeah. you're definitely considered an insider, a good guy. Uh, but yeah, that, I regularly go to Microsoft with you, teach Windows internals classes. We go to dinner with key people on the Microsoft Windows uh, team. Have so a good relationship. You've come a long way. Mark. I've come a long way. Now, one of the things you should be aware of if you're using the sysinternals tools is the license that comes with them. We try not to put this in your face too much, uh, but what you should, we recommend that you visit the licensing page at sysinternals. Some of the tools will pop up uh, a EULA. Uh, which we're adopting over time. The tools are essentially free for you to download, whether it's for your use at home or within a corporate environment. But we ask that you not redistribute the tools, and that includes forms like copying them on CDs and giving them out or selling them or putting them even on a network share within your company and pointing the other users in your company at them or the other tech support people at those private versions stored uh, cached locally. The reason for this is, uh, uh, well, actually, there are a few reasons. One is that we want to make sure that people ex are exposed to the tools, know where they came from, so that they can go back and see if the tool, if they're new versions of the tools, so that they're exposed to the Sysinternals website and the other tools that are available on the site and the other information available on the site. And uh, another reason is that if somebody does want to redistribute the tools or use them in a te technical support capacity to service other people's computers, that they do pay a license for the tools. We even license the source code and the source code for many of the tools have been incorporated into commercial software. The license fees we generate off of that kind of licensing help justify the kinds of time and effort that Bryce and I spend on the tools. Uh, we earn our living primarily off of internals. The stuff we do for sysinternals is on the side, so the money helps make the time we spend there worthwhile. 
Now, you didn't mention my contribution to the Sys Internals tools. What, what contribution was that, Dave? Well, I certainly use them a lot. Right. And I, I consider you one of the best Sys Internals evangelists. That's but, true. But uh, one thing that I, I, th I think you've gotten better about over time is not taking credit implicitly for the tools, right? It's true that when I teach uh, the Windows Internals class, with or without Mark, people just by association assume that I've worked on the Sys Internals tool. So I regularly get thanked for his tools at conferences like Microsoft TechEd just recently. I got an email from a software company that gave me a free license just because I had written a book with Mark. So, like I said, you've gotten better, and uh, I don't know if you're to the point where you actually come out and say during the talk that uh, you didn't develop the tools. Like, did you tell those people that you didn't? I haven't replied to that email yet, <laughs> okay. but I just feel by our close association that I virtually have worked on the tools. It just kind of feels that way now. In fact, Dave, have you ever developed? I have, along yeah. and along okay. in a galaxy far, far away. I thought it would be good if we took a, just a moment to go to sysinternals.com. Of course, that website is evolving and changing all the time, but let's take a look uh, at the home page as it exists right now. So I'm going to switch over to the browser. Here's the home page of sysinternals, and you can see that on the left there's some main groupings, the, the class of utilities, file, security, networking, and so forth. There's a link for the uh, tools that have source code. Now, is source code available for all the tools, Mark? Uh, no, source code is only available for a, a small handful of the tools. A lot of some of the tools we feel the source provides an educational purpose. We used to actually release the source code to uh, many more tools, and specifically and importantly, Regmon and Filemon, two of the the hallmark hallmark tools of the site. But we withdrew the tools some years ago for a couple reasons. One. Uh, malware authors had used some of the techniques in the tools to develop rootkits, which has become a problem. For instance, Regmon uses a technique called system call hooking on certain Windows platforms, and that's become a popular uh, rootkit technique. Uh, another reason that we removed them is that the license agreement that was supplied with the source code said that if you wanted to incorporate into commercial software, you had to pay a licensing fee. We put in signatures in the source that if somebody reused the code, and then shipped it in their commercial product, we could look for the signatures and recognize the fact that it was based originally on Filemon and Regmon. And it turns out more than a handful of commercial software out there, we'd come across, find our signatures in it, and yet they'd never paid for a license. So That's really we, were, we were really forced, because people were, were acting this way, to withdraw the source. And now if people want to get it, they have to come and pay for it. Okay. Uh, the next link down is the link for to information. And, and uh, I know this is a very useful set of technical articles. Uh, some of which made it their way into our book, but a number of them have some details, some esoteric information that Microsoft didn't want in our book, for example. Um, so that information link is a good source for additional uh, nuggets on Windows internals. Your blog, Mark. Right. I started blogging in about March of 2005, and it's a, it's a technical blog. I'm not going to tell you what I did this weekend with my family. I'm going to talk about war stories that I've encountered myself and troubleshot myself with Sys internals tools or other Windows troubleshooting tools. This is also the place where I posted the infamous uh, Sony rootkits and DRM gone too far blog post that launched this, the media storm of, of criticism towards Sony and them surreptitiously installing a rootkit on people's machines that they'd included with the DRM software on certain Sony uh, CDs. So the, the blog has become a popular place for people to go and find out about rootkits and Windows troubleshooting. I actually recommend in, in uh, our troubleshooting classes that people go to the full blog index, which I'm clicking on now, and quite a number of these articles, and Mark, you've been quite prolific since you started blogging, uh, are very, very educational to read through in detail to see could you follow or do you understand the troubleshooting steps, solving various hangs or uh, other, other uh, troubleshooting issues, putting into practice the tools you've written in a real live troubleshooting scenario. So I would recommend taking time to actually look at some of these blog posts, read them, uh, as well as the comments. And there is a uh, RSS feed, if you notice, when we were looking at the site on the top, so you can keep up to date with new entries uh, as Mark posts new blog entries. Continuing on the main highlights of the site is the Sys Internals forum, something that I, I feel a little guilty about because I'm just not having well, time to... I've asked you to contribute there, just and you've got a lot of expertise and experience you could share, but I guess you're doing it in other ways through this video series, for example. But it'd be nice if you were there every now and then. I try to go there and post and monitor what's going on. Fortunately, there are a number of people that I've made moderators that do a great job of guiding people through problems, answering questions, and, and generally monitoring what's going on in the, the forums. Seems to be pretty active, Mark. If I look at the number of posts, there's actually thousands of posts. If you scroll down the bottom, you'll see that it has 7,000, currently has 7,000 members that have posted uh, 14,000 topics in 
uh, or 14,000 posts and 4,000 topics. And the forum was launched in, I believe, August. So that reflects roughly half a year as the forums got more active. You don't need to actually register to read the forums. You only need to register if you want to make a posting. So uh, no restriction there. Now the forum itself is divided into certain, several categories. It's troubleshooting with the system internals utilities. If you're having a problem with one of the tools, a bug or a question about how to use it, that's where you'd go post. A little bit further down, you can see Windows discussion. So some more general topics, how to troubleshoot malware, which has become, I just added that recently, it's become a very popular forum. Troubleshooting Windows in, in general, uh, information about Windows internals, or if you're developing either kernel mode or user mode software for Windows, that's a great place to go and find information, ask questions. And then finally, the kind of the meta forums about sys internals, if you've got a bug or, or you found in the site itself or a suggestion for improving the sys internals in general, that's where you could post it. Now, there was a quick way I noticed that you could see what the hot topics were. Where is that? Yeah, if you go up to active topics there. Yep. Okay, see on the top, active topics. Click on that, and that shows you activity since the time. You can see there's a drop down there, and so that's since uh, today, just a few hours ago. And I, that's what I use. Now, once you get up to speed in the forums and you want to see what people are talking about uh, as time goes on, go to active topics and, and that'll keep you up to date with things that have changed since the last time you Actually, visited. it looks like memory usage is a topic and I know that's one of my expertise So maybe areas. you could uh, respond to that. I'll try to jump into that tonight, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Uh, going back to the home page, um, the newsletter is mentioned. Yeah, the newsletter used to serve actually a different role than it serves today. Before I blogged, the newsletter was a place where I'd have an editorial and information and tips on Windows internals. Now I've kind of moved that kind of activity into the blog. But the Sys internals now is for people that maybe aren't integrated with RSS and aren't able to be notified of changes to the site on a, uh, as they occur. This comes out maybe once a quarter. Even less? Even less sometimes now. Now, just so I can get a little credit, yeah. haven't I had some you've, connection you've with You've had this? some connection with it. You've written some guest editorials, and you've helped put, actually, some of the newsletters together. Almost really, ghost-written them. Almost ghost-written, which I really appreciate. So if I want to sign up for the newsletter, just stick in my email address here and click sign up. That's yeah, all and you don't do. even need to go there. You can see on the left side Oh, yeah, here. right on the home yep. page. Okay. Um, if I go back to the home page, there's one other thing I wanted to point out that you added um, some time ago that has really been handy for me. In fact, it's an embarrassment that I've even needed this, given how often we talk. Under the What's New, you have an RSS feed. Mm -hmm. That RSS feed is updated by Mark when he updates tools, and often his tool updates are small enough that they don't make it into the What's New section. They don't merit a mention on the home page. So the RSS feed has been pretty uh, reliable as far as minor updates to tools. So that's the best way to keep up to date with System Internals tools is subscribe to that RSS feed. So let's dive into the process and thread related tools on the site. And the heart of this, the, the sort, of, sort of flagship process and thread related tool, which serves as a tool that exposes other aspects of uh, Windows behavior that are categorized on, on the Sys Internals menu, is Process Explorer. I know you like to call it uh, Super Task Manager, right, which I really appreciate. Ta process Explorer, let me go ahead and pull it up so we can see what it does. It goes way further than uh, what Task Manager shows you. One of the first things you see is that instead of a flat list of processes running on your system, you see an indented tree view, which shows the parent-child relationship between processes. And parent-child relationship can help you understand the connection between different processes, especially in a malware situation, to understand if a malicious process is launching as a child of IE, for example. Also, the tooltip, that's just such a critical piece of data about a process, the yep. full path. And for Windows service process, hosting processes, the names of the services running within them. If you've got a run DLL process, the hosted DLL. A lot of the changes made to Process Explorer and many of the other tools on Sys Internals are driven by malware, actually not for troubleshooting in particular. Run DLL tooltip is one example, where malware is now trying to hide in the standard task manager process list as a run DLL hosted DLL. Uh, another malware related example here, this highlighting you see on Avant Browser, which is a, a browser extension that we run. It's not malware, it's legitimate software, but the purple indicates that the image is packed or compressed, which is another common malware obfuscation technique. This is just scratching the surface. Uh, we can, we're going to highlight a few of the details here, but uh, we've got a separate video as part of this library series that dives deep into using Process Explorer. Dave, do you want to show? Something? Well, I think if you just bring up the process properties, for example, I'll just take Explorer 
and we can see the breadth of tabs, details about the image, the version, the time, the command line, the parent process ID, just something as simple as the start time. Being able to find out when did a process come to life is useful. Uh, the performance and performance graph tab provide quick access to basic process performance statistics. Um, the threads tab uh, provides a level of inspection within a process way beyond what you could do with Task Manager. It lets you inspect thread activity. This is very helpful for trying to understand what a multi-purpose process is doing, like an SVC host or inetinfo.exe or the system process. You can even suspend individual threads, kill threads. Uh, you can look at open TCP IP ports, details on the security token for a process, the environment variables, and then looking at the strings inside an image. If you right-click on a process, some of the operations you can perform, bringing a window to the front if there's one associated, changing priorities like in Task Manager. Suspend, though, is really one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to suspend a process that's consuming CPU time temporarily, or, for example, a process that's doing a lot of disk or network I.O., would temporarily put that process on ice, allow you to perform some other procedures, and then go resume it without the process ever knowing. Uh, one of the other things I want to mention about Process Explorer is the, you're, what we're looking at is the, the process view, the list of processes you're running on the system. In Process Explorer, you can open up what's called a lower pane view, and there's one of two lower pane views. I'm, on, I'm going to uh, bring up here the handle view, which shows us the list of resources that are open by this process right now, organized by type here. Uh, so this would be references to files, directories, register keys, synchronization objects. And the other view is the DLL view, or the map file view, as Dave likes to call it, which shows you the DLLs mapped into this process, as well as the executable image that's mapped into this process, version information, just like you see in the process view, as well as map files, like here we have a national language string file that's been mapped into this process. I can't uh, not mention the find dialog because that really leverages both of those lower pane views. When you click on find handle or DLL, you can then look for open files or memory map files across all the processes on the system. So if you have a file locked error, for example, or a DLL you're trying to replace, you can find out immediately who's got that loaded. There are a couple of command line tools that uh, provide similar information to those two lower panes. Handle.exe shows the open handles for each process, and list DLL shows the uh, list list the DLLs loaded by each process. So this is a command line equivalent to that lower pane. There are a number of the PS tools that are related to process management. And let's first talk about what the PS tools package is to begin with. PS tools started with one utility called, I originally called PS list. And PS list, the first one there on the list in front of you, is a tool that shows you what processes are currently running on your machine. Let me go ahead and pull up PS list. PS list is basically a command line version of Task Manager or Process Explorer. It shows you the name of the process, the process ID, and various other pieces of information about that process. You can even launch it so that it shows you a tree list type uh, or a Task Manager self-updating type view where every second, by default, it will update and show you who's consuming the most CPU. Uh, you can show, have it dump you the tree view, so that just like in Process Explorer. I think one of the most important things about not just PS List, but all the PS tools, is they all support execution on a remote machine. And wasn't that a common theme in your developing the PS tool suite? Right. And as I started to develop tools and I realized that, hey, uh, execution locally as well as execution remotely from a command prompt without requiring you to install any software on the remote machine in order to get that remote functionality was the common tie-in. And so the rest of the tools I prefixed with the letters PS just to tie the whole thing together under this common theme. So PS kill, you can terminate processes with that that you see in PS list, locally or remotely. PS suspend, suspend processes, command line in, uh, version of the process explorer, suspend functionality. PS exec is one of the most popular of the PS tools because it lets you launch processes other than the PS tools on a remote system. So if I wanted to, for instance, launch a command prompt on a remote system, I could type PS exec remote system name command. And the beauty of that is that that reconnects the input and output streams of that remote console pro process, in this case command, back to the local command window. Uh, so it would appear that if I executed that command, uh, that I'm interacting with that command prompt, even though it's running on a remote system, as if it were running locally. PS Exec just has a bazillion switches and options, not only to specify remote computer names, but text files that may have a list of computers. So in a single command, you can execute uh, a script or run a program across your whole enterprise. 
You can specify the security context. You can copy the program to the remote system, specify priorities, really all the basic process control features for executing programs on the local or remote system is available with right. PSExec. And including uh, an option that is important in today's security uh, conscious environment, running a process with low rights, even though you're logged into the administrator launching a process with limited rights, kind of like IE7's protected mode in Vista. You can get on down-level versions of Windows using PSExec and this equivalent functionality in Process Explorer. And the final process-related tool in the PS Tool Suite is PS Service, which lets, it's similar to the SC command that's built into Windows XP, has a little bit more richness. I always try to go above and beyond what Windows provides itself. Otherwise, what's the point of making a standalone separate version? So PS Service, a lot of service control functionality and service monitoring functionality. Some other PS tools are more related to looking at system-wide information. For example, PS Info queries uh, using several different mechanisms in Windows, basic information about the Windows installation and the hardware configuration. So I'm going to bring up a command prompt and just briefly run PS Info without any switches. And we see that it returns for the local system by default information such as the uptime. Wow, your laptop's been up for almost a day now, Mark. The version number of Windows, uh, system root, uh, there's switches in PS Info to look at the number of hotfixes, but more importantly, PS Info can be used to query the information across the enterprise uh, by refer referencing a remote system. Other PS tools related to getting system information are PS log list from a command line to be able to access the Windows event logs and put them into a format that can be processed by things like Excel or SQL Server, and PS logged on, which reports who's logged on interactively on the machine. Some of the other system information tools include one of the most popular, BG Info. BG Info is a tool that lets you put on your desktop background inf information that you want to have handy. For instance, your network adapter uh, type, your uh, domain logon, the machine name that authenticated you, the local computer name, the local IP address, virtually anything you want. BG Info can integrate with the registry, integrate with a SQL server, integrate with WMI. Uh, VB scripts so that you can customize the desktop however you want, graphically however you want. And companies like to license BG Info. It's actually one of the most popular tools licensed by corporations that they will deploy it across the enterprise so that all of the end users' desktops have easy to see information so that when somebody goes to troubleshoot a system, they can see exactly what machine they're, they're looking at. Proc Features is a relatively new command line utility that will show you the some of the processor features that are relevant to the way Windows operates, like whether it has did execution protection or not. And load order is a tool that shows you the startup ordering of device drivers that, that are configured statically as starting in a particular location during the boot process. Pend moves is a tool that basically formats some data in the registry that the session manager process uses on a reboot to replace system files after the next reboot that can't be replaced while the files are in use. It's very interesting to run pen moves whenever you have the message after installing a hotfix or any software product that says you must now restart your system. That's because some system file couldn't be replaced. Go ahead and run pen moves and you'll see which files are going to be replaced or deleted on the next reboot. And Portmon is a simple monitoring tool to trace serial port I.O., what is both read and written to and from the serial port. There are a couple of tools that are focused on developers. One is Debug View. It's one of the most popular tools on the site for developers because it captures the uh, debug output coming out of their applications, whether their application is a user mode application, a .NET application, even a kernel mode driver. Debug view will capture that information to a nice list view, let them save to log files, it supports filtering and highlighting and all sorts of advanced capabilities, including capturing debug output coming from a remote system. And WinObj is the other developer-related tool, which looks inside of the internal Windows object manager namespace. That namespace is where developer controlled objects like synchronization objects are given names and stored so they can peer into that namespace, see the state of their synchronization objects, and look at just what other synchronization objects might be there. And that whole object manager topic is one of the things that we address in depth in our book Windows Internals. Live KD was a tool that Mark originally wrote for our uh, first book together inside Windows 2000, third edition. It was originally only shipped on the book CD-ROM. And uh, its purpose was to provide a capability that's now possible out of the box on Windows XP and later, and that's live kernel debugging. That simply means using the Microsoft Supply kernel debugger tools to inspect the state of the live system as opposed to operating on a crash dump. Live KD permits using the kernel debugger on Windows NT4 and Windows 2000 in addition to XP and Server 2003 and Vista 
uh, and that makes it convenient for doing some of the experiments that we had in our book. But it actually provides some capabilities that the built-in support in Windows XP and later uh, cannot do in the local kernel debugging, and that is the ability to dump the live system, to run the debugger and use the dot dump command to take a memory snapshot. And I know, Mark, you've gotten positive feedback from Microsoft product support mm -hmm. about that. That's right. They've actually the ones that told us that that was even possible. I hadn't even thought of using it for that purpose, but they snapshot a live system, keep it running, go diagnose the problem, and then come back and address the problem. We talk a lot about that scenario and other crash and stability problems in the crash analysis video that's part of this series. FileMon, of course, is one of the couple most well-known tools off the site. FileMon was, in fact, one of the first tools, if not the first tool, that Bryce and I wrote for Windows NT. And I wrote it originally to understand the way Windows works and also to help me debug the way my own applications worked. It monitors all file system activity. And I'm going to go ahead and launch it here so we can see what it looks like. And you can see that it's there's a lot of file system activity going on in my system. It tells us exactly what process is performing the activity, tells us what type of the, the operation type is, the target path or file, the result of the operation, and information about the particular operation. This tool is useful not only for troubleshooting application problems, but troubleshooting security issues. I know that uh, a lot of enterprises are trying to lock down their users as into limited user and so that they can't, malware can't infect the machine. And one of the challenges they face is applications that aren't designed to work in a limited user environment. Process Explorer, uh, FileMon can help you troubleshoot those kinds of problems because the result codes for operations not designed for limited user environments is access denied. And you can very clearly see access denied errors, see the resource that the application is trying to access, and then go and fix the permissions to let your line of business apps work in such a limited user environment. It's kind of amazing when you just run FileMon to see the amount of file I.O. going on that you might not realize is happening. And I know I'm sitting there sometimes and my hard drive light starts blinking on my laptop. So I fire up FileMon just to see where these I.O. is coming from. But Mark's added some powerful filtering capabilities. You can bring up a filter dialog and specify which processes to include or exclude. Paths also can be specified. You can highlight items that meet a certain criteria. So it is possible with FileMon to reduce the amount of data that's been captured. And we actually have an entire uh, video as part of this library series, Troubleshooting with FileMon and Regmon, that goes in-depth into a number of problems that you can diagnose with FileMon, how to get the most out of it uh, very easily. So we cover scenarios where corrupt files are causing applications to fail, permissions problem cause very strange message boxes. We've got some really yeah. <laughs> amusing examples of applications that throw up completely bizarre message boxes when they get access denied. And also just configuration issues. The FileMon can help reveal misconfigured applications, files that are being referenced in the wrong place. So it's really, Microsoft Product Support considers FileMon and its uh, cousin Regmon yep. to be absolutely essential tools for application and system. And it's also useful for development. I actually have uh, a letter from the Microsoft Office team thanking me for FileMon and their, their use of FileMon in troubleshooting the performance of, of Office. I actually got a free game out of that. There are some disk-related tools that aren't specifically looking at files at the system from a file level, like Diskmon, which monitors disk, uh, disk I.O. A lot of people go to the site, it turns out, and they're looking for something that will tell them what's going on when their hard disk light is flashing. Diskmon is a little bit too low level for that. It shows you exactly what disk sectors are being read to and written from as they're occurring. It doesn't show you what process has caused it because at that low level, there's a disconnect between the process that might have made a change to a file or directory and the disk I.O. that happens later as the system is writing that data back to disk. Disk view is a kind of a disk mapper tool. So you pull that up and it scans your system, looking at all the clusters on the volume, telling you what file an individual cluster belongs to. So you will be able to click on or go to a particular cluster on the disk. It will tell you it's part of a certain file and show you in highlighted colors the other regions on the or locations on the disk occupied by that file. So uh, you know, we find people that find that interesting. I've personally not used it myself, but it came out of other work that Bryce and I did for Winternals. And finally, DU is a command line disk usage utility. It's called DU, just like this, the Unix tool of the same name. And I'm going to bring up a command prompt here and type DU to see the disk usage allocation of a subdirectory I've got in the, the temp directory. I've specified the dash L switch, which tells DU to specify the disk usage of subdirectories one level deep inside of that directory, or two levels deep, rather. And so, for instance, I can see that uh, this subdirectory here has occupied 173 bytes 
of that total space. And at the bottom, I get a summary, which tells me that the entire C temp directory is 3 meg, has a certain number of files, and so on. So if you're wondering where your disk space is going and, you're, and you like command line programs, do use the tool for you. There's a couple of other file system disk related tools that I've uh, found handy. One is Contig. Now, Windows has a built in defrag, but it defrags an entire volume. Contig lets you defrag an individual file. Maybe there's a single, a very large file that's performance sensitive to your application. So if we go back to the command prompt, we can see what Contig provides. It's got a switch to analyze the fragmentation of a file instead of uh, fix it. So let's go just analyze the fragmentation of what should we look at? How about the temp directory? And I forgot the minus V for verbose. Yep. And that's the directory and itself. I want temp start out star. And now we here we can see contig just analyze the contiguity of each of the files, display the number of fragments. And if we saw a particular file that was highly fragmented, contig could be used to defragment that one file. Yeah, what I find is that uh, some companies like to defragment specific database files or other files that are becoming fragmented on a regular basis. They'll just launch, instead of launching a system wide defragmentation job, they'll target those, just those files that are becoming uh, fragmented. Now, speaking of fragmentation, the page file is a file that is certainly uh, related to system performance, and it would be bad if the page file was heavily fragmented. Page defrag is a tool that Mark wrote that lets you analyze this, the fragmentation level of the page file and other key system files, like the Hibernate file and the registry hives and the system event logs. If you choose to defrag the page file, that is actually done at the next reboot because the page file is one file that cannot be defragged because it's open in a very special way by the operating system. So that's a capability that you'll find in high-end defrag tools that you have to pay money for. Page defrag does that for free. Now, I know you actually wrote such a high-end defrag tool, Winternal's defrag w manager. That's right. Winternal's defrag manager, it's not aimed at the individual user. It's aimed at the corporate environment where you install a console and then schedule machines across your enterprise to be defragged. It has an agent that it sends out automatically, pushes to those uh, client machines, defrags, and sends results back. So you can monitor the defragmentation state of machines across your entire network. There are a number of other file system related tools on the site. Uh, for example, Junction. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that NTFS, even up through Windows XP, uh, supports the notion of symbolic links, at least at the directory level. And Junction lets you create these directory based symbolic links and also to view symbolic link uh, pointers. Uh, Vista, it turns out, takes this one step further and supports file based symbolic links. And I'll be updating Junction at some point to support that as well. Sync is another tool. Uh, it's really useful for developers that are writing kernel mode drivers because when you make modifications to files on the system, Windows, for performance reasons, keeps those modifications in memory and then flushes them back in a lazy manner. That means if the system crashes, you might lose the data that you've changed. So Sync will force Windows to write that data back to disk right then and there. If you get a crash after that data has been safely written to disk, you won't have a problem. And another place that's useful is for removable flash media, for example. So instead of having to go through the safe remove steps that you might think are a little bit slow or tedious, simply sync the drive, and then you can pull it knowing that the data has been saved to disk. Streams is a tool that shows you alternate NTFS data streams. And alternate data, NTFS data streams let you create data streams within another file that aren't visible through normal Windows tools, like Explorer or Notepad, for example. I'm going to go into my temp directory and create a file called, uh, or echo, sorry, echo some text, hello, to a file stream. So I'm going to create a file called streams and create a stream in it called stream1. Now, if I do a directory listing and specify the streams file, it shows up as having zero bytes in it, when in actuality it has the text hello in it someplace in that alternate data stream that I've specified. So I'm going to run the streams utility on that file itself. And it shows us that there is a data stream in there, an alternate data stream called stream1 that has eight bytes of data in it. And if we wanted to see what that was, we could pipe that to stream uh, to the more command, which is stream, one of the uh, few Windows built-in tools that is stream aware. Finally, strings is a utility that lets you dump the printable strings within any file, whether it be an image file or a DLL or some data file. And this can be useful for hunting down malware by looking at the strings within the images that are associated with that malware, looking for identifiers or URLs that you might 
uh, consider sub questionable. Regmon certainly is at the top of the list as being one of the most well-known and, and most downloaded tools from sysinternals. Um, in fact, Regmon was one of your earliest sysinternals tools, That's wasn't right. it? Uh, Regmon, by its name, obviously monitors registry uh, accesses, uh, monitors by default all I.O. to the registry. That can be configured with the same kind of filter and highlight features that Filemon supports. Like Filemon, it is absolutely a key troubleshooting tool. It so, uh, works so well with Filemon that I've kind of developed a motto, when in doubt, run Filemon and Regmon. So even cases where I've had no clue what that it could be file or registry related, Filemon and or Regmon has helped to solve all kinds of strange application failures. And I just want to mention, because of the, uh, the time delay on getting this video out, that by the time you're watching this, there might be a, a tool called Process Monitor, which is currently under development that is going to merge the functionality of Regmon and Filemon together and provide some additional process and thread monitoring capabilities. So you won't have to remember the motto anymore. You'll just be able to essentially run both tools in one. That's just going to be awesome, Mark. Um, one of the things that saved me is the fact that Regmon exposes queries to non-existent data. So you can see processes that are looking for things in the registry that aren't there, but if they were there, might enable some right. undocumented behavior. And there's a great story of you using that to get yourself out of a real jam, which we cover in the uh, Sysinternals Famon and Regmon troubleshooting video. Right. A uh, command line registry related tool is called RegJump. It's on the site, and RegJump lets you make shortcuts to frequently access register keys and put them in scripts or put them in uh, batch files. I'm going to, for instance, type in HK local machine system current control set, which is one of the most frequently visited keys in my work as a driver developer. And this launches regedit and takes you right to that location. This reg jump facility or feature is something that Bryce and I developed for Regmon. You can double click on the line in Regmon, it will take you to that registry key. This is just pulling that functionality out into this command line tool. And I know a lot of people like to code uh, shortcuts, put them in batch files, and then have regedit jump up to those locations. Security has certainly become a hot area, and you've been spending a lot of energy in that area lately, and certainly Sysinternals has become a source for key malware diagnosis uh, and, and cleaning. Right. One of the, the flagship tools in that area on Sysinternals is called Auto Runs. And a lot of people that go after cleaning malware off their systems might use the built-in tool because that's all they are, they're familiar with, all that's readily available. And the built-in tool is called msconfig. msconfig, unfortunately, stops short of showing you a lot of information about the startups it does show. Like, it doesn't necessarily show you the path to the image. It doesn't tell you who made it. It doesn't tell you uh, anything about it. It doesn't show you an icon, for example. Auto Runs goes way further. I'm going to pull up Auto Runs here on my system. And I've got it configured in my favorite configuration, which zooms in on the stuff that's been added to my system after Microsoft Windows was installed on it. That includes third-party stuff and stuff from Microsoft that's been added that isn't digitally signed by Microsoft. So the options I'm referring to, let me just wait here a second while the scan completes, includes for example, the verified code signatures and hide signed Microsoft entries. And, the, for example, we see a, a, micro, a, a fake malicious application that I wrote that we demonstrate in... It's in our boot startup and troubleshooting video, as well as the Process uh, Explorer troubleshooting process problems video. And it's, a, a, it's configured itself, labeled itself as a virus. It describes itself as the Windows NT logon helper application, and it says that it's from Microsoft. Uh, uh, even the startup location that you can see is right in the System32 directory where you'd expect to find such a, a core system file if it was legitimate. However, you can look and see that it's not been verified from Microsoft, which is a problematic sign, something that you should investigate. And if you do want to investigate, you can get to the, the search facility right here. Search the web to see if other people have encountered this or a virus, antivirus or an spyware company has already come across this and diagnosed it as being malicious. I can't believe how many uh, items or how many locations in the system that Auto Run shows today. I remember when I first would demo Auto Runs, there was only there were no tabs because there was just a limited set of registry keys. Still more than the built-in tools mm -hmm. showed, 
But uh, I think at this point, there's been so many discoveries that we've made of new locations in Windows where things could be scheduled to start or inserted themselves that uh, auto runs probably will never be done. Right. I mean, and it's expanded just beyond lo core system startups to things like browser helper objects, scheduled tasks, services, drivers. A uh, couple of examples of tabs that have been added because of real malware that I've come across. Print monitors. Malware installing itself as a print monitor, as a Winsock service provider, or a local security authority security provider. Always changing. The next tool is SigCheck, and this is a command line tool. If you want to check files for digital signatures, something that you should probably do to keep make sure your systems are clean of malware, SigCheck is like a file version tool, command line tool. It will show you the version information for that file. Also tell you if that file's been digitally signed and optionally by who. And then finally, one of the most uh, famous tools on the site, Rootkit Revealer, which is the tool that I used to discover the Sony Rootkit that I blogged about in the, the post that I mentioned earlier. Rootkit Revealer does what's called a cross-view look at the system to try to identify cloaked objects that might indicate the presence of malicious rootkits. So it looks for hidden files and registry keys. Something that I recommend that you run periodically on your production server, not just Rootkit Revealer, but other rootkit detection tools to make sure that stuff hasn't gotten in there and is lurking. There's some permissions related tools that are focused on the IT developer that is maybe locking down your Windows installate Windows configuration on a server or your file shares. It's really easy to misconfigure Windows configuration where you might end up with a situation where some subdirectory is allowing unauthorized users access and you've simply gone to look at the parent directory and made sure that the security is tight on that. Access Anum will do a scan of the files, directories, or registry keys that you pointed at and tell you if there's discrepancies between the security configuration of a parent object and a child object that might be an indication that you've got a security hole. Share Anum does the same thing, but it just looks at the network shares that are available or accessible from the machine on which you run it and will, can even scan the network shares of all the machines on your network looking for permissions issues where you might have a share permission configured differently than the underlying file or directory permission uh, to which that share maps, which can indicate a, a security hole as well. Two last security tools that we'd like to highlight. S-Delete provides a secure file delete. Uh, secure file delete is implemented by making several passes over a file because simply deleting the file leaves the data on the volume. So if you look at the command line switches for S-Delete here in the command prompt, you can specify the number of passes uh, whether to recur subdirectories, and I think this is an interesting one, clean, clean the free space. So if you haven't used sdelete, you have deleted some files that may contain sensitive data, do an sdelete minus z, specify the number of passes you're comfortable with, and it's going to allocate that free space and then perform the secure wiping of that free uh, unallocated disk space. And the other tool is NuSID. NuSID is very popular in a large enterprise environment where they're performing disk cloning. NuSID replicates the logic in Windows Setup to generate a security ID because if you clone a Windows installation, the computer SID or security ID needs to be made unique. Windows includes a tool called SysPrep, but when Microsoft only supports SysPrep on systems for which you haven't installed applications after the fact. And NuSID does work in most situations where you've got an image that does include bundled applications that you want to available on your uh, end user machines. Switching gears to talk about the TCP IP or networking related tools on sys internals, the, the core tool in that category is TCP view. TCP view shows you the active network connections. It's basically a, a netstat, a graphical version of netstat. So let me pull it up here. And what it does is shows you uh, the process that has the endpoint open, what type of endpoint, whether it's TCP or UDP, the local address and the remote address. And I've turned off address name resolution up here in the toolbar. I'm going to turn it back on. You can see right now I don't have any active network connections. Let's go ahead and visit a website like SysInternals. I'm going to do a refresh here in the browser. And what we see show up in green are new network connections. That's the URL of, of uh, our, the network provider that we're connecting through here, the proxy to the website. So the green and the red, which shows uh, connections that are being closed or, or connections that are disappearing, can help you identify network connections, also especially useful when you're troubleshooting malware. Another networking-related tool, Whois, worth highlighting. Whois lets you query the domain name registration database. For example, if I do whoissalsim.com, we can find out that the registrar is me, 
and my technical contact is the guy that managed my mm -hmm. ISP. Now, this tool you wrote, Mark, to be able to quickly query this database in the case of? Yeah, well, you, not, you see in TCP view or Netstat, uh, URL or IP address that you wonder if it's a malicious IP address or something legitimate, you can quickly look it up. AD Restore is another networking related tool. It's useful only in the domain environment and only if you're a domain administrator. A lot of people don't realize that AD Active Directory has what's basically the equivalent of the Windows Recycle Bin, where when you delete an object out of Active Directory, it goes into a deleted objects folder. And Windows doesn't provide any UI or any even command line to be able to access the contents of that deleted objects folder and pull those objects back out. So if you make a mistake, for example, delete a user account, delete an organizational unit, that thing's going to be lost to you without the use of some add-on tool like AD Restore. AD Restore is a command line tool. You point it at the domain controller. You specify it uh, looks in the deleted objects folder, prints out the deleted objects, and asks you if you want to restore them. So I know that I've gotten at least uh, a handful of people that have just said it's really saved their day having AD Restore able to undo a, a change they've made by accident in Active Directory. The last tool, or I'm not even sure I could call it a tool on sysinternals, is something that Many wonder how you had the time to write, and that's the System Internals Blue Screen Screensaver. What's the history of that, Mark? Well, how could I resist writing a tool that's so much fun? Uh, the System Internals Blue Screen Screensaver is a screensaver that mimics an authentic looking blue screen of death. And it started out back in 1996, was the, I wrote the first version for NT4. And it, it's had so much fun. We've gotten so many, I've uh, gotten so many interesting stories of people using it to play jokes on other people or, or uh, just that they've enjoyed having it on their systems that I've continued to evolve it. Today, the version of Blue Screen works uh, on everything up through uh, Vista by the time you watch this to mimic a uh, Blue Screen authentic to the version of Windows you're running on. But not just that, it, the screensaver displays the Blue Screen, then it simulates a authentic looking reboot complete with the Windows splash screen that you see during the boot process, and then comes up to a desktop just as about to, to get Windows up and running, boom, you Blue Screen again. It's so authentic that I've actually fooled you <laughs> using your own screen And I saver. fooled you. And it's fooled Microsoft kernel developers that actually write the code to generate blue screens. So. Now, if you'd like to have some fun with the blue screen screen saver, you can download it and use it in conjunction with PS Exec to actually run it on a remote computer. But we recommend doing that with caution because it could cause some uh, alarm on the part of the other user. And of course, like all the PS tools, you need to have local administrative privilege on the remote system that you're running it against. So it's not like you can just go to anybody's machine or anybody else can go to your machine on the network. And speaking of that, I want to just briefly mention talking about PS Exec is that uh, some of the tools in the PS Tool Suite have been flagged by antivirus as being malicious. These are false positives that are caused by the fact that some of the tools have actually been used in viruses to propagate themselves like PS Exec. Well, Mark, this was just a great tour of the current tools on Sysinternals. We know it's evolved and uh, grown tremendously since it started back in 1996. Um, best way to keep up to date? Your RSS feed, would you say? That's absolutely the best way. And, and check out the newsletter, too, because there might be some things that come out of band in the newsletter as well.